open up this? I would be happy to. Thank you, Diana. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Beth Hirschfeld, and I am the president of the Canada UAE Business Council. On behalf of the four Canada UAE Business Councils, the Canadian Business Council Dubai, the Canadian Business Council Abu Dhabi, and the Canada Arab Business Council, a very warm welcome to you all. It is an absolute pleasure to have you join us for today's webinar. The four business councils work with individual companies to help them to understand regional opportunities and regulations, develop government and business relationships, and build brand awareness in the region. One of the ways we do this is through education, such as these types of webinars. So we are delighted to have partnered with Dubai FDI to bring you today's session, the Dubai Advantage Technology Sector Opportunities. A sincere thank you to CBC Dubai and Dubai FDI for taking the lead in organizing today's session. As many of you well know, the UAE has been a true leader in the technology sector. Under Dubai's smart city strategy, authorities are embarking on more than 545 initiatives designed to reshape the way residents and visitors alike experience the city. From fintech to robotics to 3D printing and everything in between, Dubai has its sights firmly set on technology and innovation and is working towards transforming the Emirate into a leading global smart city. I'm really looking forward to learning more about the wealth of opportunities and potential during today's session. So without further ado, please let me introduce today's moderator, Ali Herji, the lead researcher of Durham College's AI Hub and Center for Cybersecurity Innovation. Ali was born in Dubai and emigrated to Canada as an international student in 2007 and is a graduate of York University. With an impressive career working with well-known telecom firms such as Bell and & Rogers and Orion, Ali is now the lead researcher at Durham College's AI Hub and Center for Cybersecurity Innovation. As the AI Hub's project manager, Ali has over 12 years of experience working with a variety of technology implementations in the government, academic, and not-for-profit sectors. Through his leadership, in 2018, Durham College was included in Canada's top 50 research college list for the sixth consecutive year. Ali is currently completing his PhD in communications at York University and holds multiple research and teaching positions. As we turn the floor over to Ali, you will see that a pop-up screen has um, shown up on your screen with a poll. To help us tailor today's session to best meet your needs, we encourage you all to please complete this poll. Thank you everyone for joining today. I hope you enjoyed the session and over to you, Ali. Beth, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, I will say that I am not worthy of many of those accolades because all of those get achieved with uh, the great team members, students and researchers alike that, uh, that I get to work with. And, uh, and that's a very good segue into just introducing myself by thanking uh, a lot of the contributors to today's session, uh, beginning with Al. Uh, Al, I really appreciate the fact that you entrusted me with this opportunity. Um, the whole team, the Canadian Business Council, so on and so forth, that's been instrumental in the parlance of this webinar. Um, and importantly, uh, our friend uh, Maddy Raza from CyberX and Cyber Exchange, that hosts uh, the world's first cybersecurity studio, as well as uh, my colleagues at Durham College, uh, my students who are on as well, and some of my colleagues uh, who continue to support our engagements uh, globally. I'm going to take the next few minutes to kind of just set the tone for what the next 90 minutes are going to look like. For me, this webinar is uh, a seminal moment in my career because it is actually the first time that I've had a chance to parlay what I'm doing in technology with my home. As many of you know, and as was mentioned by Beth, is uh, I grew up uh, in my formative years during Dubai's formative years as well. And uh, I am a byproduct of the investments in education and the vision. Um, I had the honor and the humility of living under the leadership of Sheikh Zayed. And uh, my father always reminded me of a statement that he made, which is the past is, uh, or rather history, is nothing but a changed series of consecutive events. The present is nothing but a continuation of the past. And the fact that I was part of those investments in education, in talent, in people, 
in attracting infrastructure. Today, that Dubai is perhaps one of the leading attractors of foreign direct investment in AI and technology is no surprise. That vision of the forefathers is becoming a reality. And as Beth mentioned, it is no surprise that you have 545 projects on the go specific to smart communities. One of the things that I always remind my students is that when you're thinking about technology, when you're thinking about investments in technology, you can either move forward into growth or you can move backwards into safety. And I'd make the argument that today you're gonna to learn how Dubai has moved forward into growth securely. We'll be talking around concepts around AI, cybersecurity and blockchain and really getting to understand what the return on investment and the return on imagination is in such relationships. You'll notice today that we'll have uh, at least two keynote speakers. We we'll peppered it with a couple of videos and then we'll have some technology presentations followed by a closing Q&A. So with that, I'm gonna jump right into the agenda. It is an honor for me to not only be speaking to you from Canada in the beautiful Durham region in a city called Oshawa, but it's even more important for me that I'm speaking to you from Ontario. And our first speaker, Ayad Kutsi, is the area director for the Middle East and North Africa region for our Ontario government responsible for job creation, growth and prosperity. So Ayad, I'm gonna turn it over to you for the next few minutes to say a little bit about yourself and the work that you're doing on behalf of the Ontario government in the United Arab Emirates. Ayad, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Ali. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I get good morning in Ontario and good evening in Dubai. Uh, I would like to thank, uh, I would like to thank you all for uh, joining us in this uh, important webinar for uh, innovation and technology uh, sector opportunities in the United Arab Emirates. And uh, I would like to thank our partner, the Canadian Business Council in Dubai and uh, Dubai FDI as well. And on behalf of Ontario government, I would like to welcome you all. Um, uh, Ontario Ministry of Economic Development, Education and the Trade. Um, I work uh, as um, Middle East and Africa Area Director in the International Business Growth uh, Branch. And uh, the uh, scope of uh, our branch in the ministry is to, uh, uh, is to create job opportunities, drive job opportunities uh, in Ontario by increasing the number of exporters. Uh, diversifying export markets and uh, scaling up Ontario SMEs by export. Uh, uh, we assist Ontario company to increase export and diversifying through a, a different channel, uh, starting from supporting them and uh, organizing uh, B2B meetings in the target markets and um, uh, organizing international mission to the biggest trade event, sector trade event uh, on the world. Um, we help them to uh, export everywhere on the globe, almost everywhere. Um, we uh, participate in the biggest trade event to, with the Ontario Pavilion, and uh, we take about uh, up to uh, up to 2025 20, companies with us uh, to the um, biggest trade events. Uh, we uh, organize uh, inbound missions, seminar, webinar, conferences, and uh, meet buyers uh, events as well. Uh, we almost work in all important sectors, uh, starting from energy, renewable energy, uh, innovations, ICT, life science, uh, auto, uh, e-commerce, uh, aerospace and aviation, defense and security, uh, mining. Uh, we cover almost uh, all important sectors. Uh, now, if we talk a little bit about uh, our uh, bilateral trade with the United Arab Emirates, um, United Arab Emirates is an uh, important market to Ontario, and uh, it's the ninth, it's ninth uh, largest export market uh, for Ontario. In 2019, Ontario bilateral trade with UAE exceeds uh, uh, around $470 million with over 80% uh, export. To UAE. Uh, I would say that uh, top Ontario export to the UAE include uh, life science, um, machinery, uh, data processing machines, helicopter, uh, automotive, ICT, uh, communication product and uh, computers, uh, as well as uh, green energy and uh, water and wastewater products. 
top uh, top Ontario import from UAE include uh, jewelry, um, um, uh, plastic plates, sheets, uh, um, cranes, um, mobile lifting frames, and uh, food. Um, if we talk a little bit about our uh, yearly calendar events in UAE as international missions, uh, we usually participate in the biggest trade events uh, like uh, 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 Dubai Air Show, um, like IDEX. For th uh, this year, uh, we would be participating in four or five events. Uh, YTEX as uh, water and wastewater and clean tech missions. It's next month in uh, uh, October, it's a virtual mission, and the uh, YTEX is the biggest um, uh, clean tech energy event in the MENA region. And uh, we will participate also in JITEX, the uh, virtual mission. As you, you know, JITEX is the third largest uh, technology event in the world, and it's in the first one in the MENA region. Uh, last year, we had participated in JITEX, and we achieved uh, great success stories, actually. Uh, in addition to the great stories when we participated in Dubai Air Show, uh, this year we we'll participated and we we'll participated in IDEX, the defense, the biggest uh, defense trade event in the MENA region. It's in uh, February. Uh, we'll be having pavilion, and uh, I hope the pandemic will be finished by uh, February. We'll see. Uh, we'll be participating in uh, uh, Arab Health as uh, the, the biggest life science event uh, in the MENA region as well, in addition to uh, doing um, many of uh, virtual events like uh, webinar and conferences with our partners, with the Canada Business Council, Canadian Business Council in UAE, uh, Dubai FTI, uh, Canada Arab Business Council in Toronto as well. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, UAE is one of the most important events, uh, one, one of the most important markets uh, to uh, Ontario, and we are looking forward always to support Ontario companies to increase exports uh, over there, and we are uh, open for sure to increase imports from UAE. And um, um, if, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, yeah, you will see, I guess, on the first slide, uh, my email address, my phone number. Uh, I'm based in Toronto, and um, uh, I go to Dubai about uh, five to six times every year. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact me for anything related to uh, export UAE and to the GCC regions in general. Thank you, Ali, and uh, I will leave the floor now to, um, to our partners. Thank you so much, Ayad. And I think it's really important for our audience to understand is that Ayad is not only talking about a relationship between a province uh, and the UAE, he's talking about not a partnership, really. And if you look at some of the stats that are there and some of the vision that Dubai has, including uh, increasing its broadband capacity by 15 times, server security by 20 times, and increasing its subscriber base by a large percentage, Ontario has a very strong role to play in that and support in that. And our partnerships with GTAX, for example, is a very good example of that. Coming up next, you're gonna see a video on growth. And you'd remember earlier on, I mentioned about secure growth. And I say this all the time that uh, creativity is thinking about something new, innovation is getting it done. Heba, I'm gonna turn it over to you to play this video to show you how uh, Dubai is getting innovation done. Heba, over to you in the video. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for that, Hiba. And uh, as the video summarized for you, Dubai is uh, at the cusp of for defining what is beyond possible. Enough from me, and we're going to jump into some of our keynote presentations from here. Uh, we, there are a couple of folks who couldn't join us uh, primarily due to work commitments, as well as uh, in one case, an illness. I do wish everybody well and that they're taking care and staying healthy. Uh, I'm going to turn it over actually to Al, who 
Uh, in place of our keynote, it's actually going to read some of the keynote who cannot make it here, some of his comments directly from Al. So Al, I'll turn the floor over to you to read out uh, the opening keynote speech. Al? Thank you very much, Ali, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we welcome you today to join us in this discussion on the partnership opportunities in Dubai's technology sector and how these can be of advantage to Canadian businesses and investors. Dubai is the city of the future as it deploys the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution to enhance stakeholder happiness. At the same time, Dubai remains an important gateway to the region's emerging markets, while its advanced infrastructure positions Dubai as a global hub for trade and investment. We at Dubai FDI are grateful to the Canadian Business Council of both Dubai and Abu Dhabi, the, Canadian, uh, the Canada Arab Business Council, and the Canada UAE Business Council for their participation. We also thank the Government of Ontario and Iyad and his team for uh, helping us out today as well. To provide a comprehensive picture of the opportunities in Dubai's technology sector, representatives from Smart Dubai, Dubai International Financial Center, and Dubai Future Foundation join us today. <coughs> Excuse me. Ladies and gentlemen, the UAE and Canada have a, have a strong bilateral trade partnership. The UAE is Canada's top trading partner in the Middle East and North Africa. It is also among Canada's largest investors. Canadian FDI into Dubai was more than 1 billion Canadian dollars between 2015 and 2018. More than 150 Canadian brands operate in the UAE and over 40,000 Canadians call the UAE home. Canada is the UAE's second largest export market in North America. The UAE is a diverse, stable, and secure economy. Your presence in the UAE ensures seamless access to the market of more than 2.4 billion consumers in the Middle East, Africa, South Asia, and the CIS. With its mature and growing infrastructure, Dubai and its global hub for business, trade, and investment flows. This is the reason why more than 60% of the Fortune 1000 companies have established a presence in Dubai. Technology across sectors, including the emergent sector of clean tech, has been an area of mutual cooperation between our countries. One of the most recent examples of this is a collaboration between the Canadian company Manitoba Hydro International and Khalifa University of Science and Technology and Abu Dhabi Transmission and Dispatch Company. In January of 2019, the three ent entities signed an agreement to collaborate on building industrial level software to monitor, predict, and interact with network operators in real time and enable renewable energy integration with the UAE power grid. The UAE has emerged as the second highest regional investor in artificial intelligence. Over the past 10 years, until 2019, investing more than 2.15 billion US dollars in this endeavor. Taking the lead in implementing the emerging technologies of the fourth industrial revolution and incubating high technology startups, Dubai has become one of the first in the world to utilize the benefits of artificial intelligence, robotics and machine learning, blockchain, financial technologies or FinTech and health IT. Along with these, Dubai's focus on a 3D printing, cybersecurity, and geographic information systems. Ladies and gentlemen, in spite of challenging global situation this year, Dubai continues to attract technology investments with a focus on optimizing growth in all sectors that use technology. This is because there is a growing awareness globally that Dubai is one of the most attractive locations for technology businesses. Let me give you some data to support this. In the first half of this year, we received a total of 190 FDI projects worth an estimated 4.3 billion Canadian dollars. Of these, the technology and e-commerce industries commanded an impressive share. We have been happy to witness a 53% increase in medium and high technology investments in the first half of 2020, compared with the same period last year. Dubai-based startups attracted sustained FDI inflows of more than 
$263 million Canadian dollars in the first six months of 2020, according to data from the Dubai FDI monitor, which you can access online. Between 2015 and 2018, the medium and high technology categories represented the largest proportion of technology FDI projects from Canada into Dubai. Our nation's leadership has long recognized that technology is a key differentiator across all sectors. Dubai's digital readiness and its ability to offer diverse, attractive investment opportunities for the entrepreneurial and technology sectors has been one of the key reasons that the Emirates economy is so successfully navigating an unprecedented challenges posed by the COVID-19 crisis. We at Dubai are happy to work alongside of you, assisting you at every step of your investment journey in Dubai. Come join us in achieving our goal to be the future of innovation and create the innovation of the future. Thank you for your time and attention. Ali? Thank you so much, Al. And uh, what can I say except that uh, when I was hearing all of those stats that you threw at us, including the areas in AI and cybersecurity, it, it reminded me of Sheikh Mohammed's line, which is, the race of excellence has, uh, has no finish line. And clearly there is no finish line in this progress that uh, we're headed towards and you won't settle for anything less than first place. So Al, thank you for stepping in and, and reading out that fascinating keynote, which was peppered with some really important stats. You know, Al, um, one of the things that I also took from that was this aspect on the investment on technology, but also the aspect of investment in people, right? And uh, I always say this, you've heard me say this a lot of times, is that computers are pretty useless because they only give you answers. You need human analysis there. You need human uh, intervention there. You need folks to understand how these technologies are coming in together in order to prevent uh, bias, in order to prevent certain vulnerabilities. And I think uh, UAE's commitment to AI ethics as well is something that will probably come into during the Q&A. Now, Al, forgive me, but I do need some confirmation from you. Um, I do have scheduled next to have His Excellency Saeed Alawadi giving some comments. Do we have Saeed on? Uh, Saeed is, uh, is away sick at the moment, unfortunately. Um, we hope it's not COVID. Hopefully not. And, um, uh, so let's, we'll move yeah, to we'll our- move on to the next element. So yes, yeah. so on behalf of everyone, I do wish His Excellency Saeed uh, the very best of health and recovery. Uh, Hiba, if I can prompt you to get the video on sustainability ready with this uh, element of note that I really want you folks to enjoy this video from the perspective of often we build products for function, uh, but we don't build it for, for form and sustainability. We don't build it long term. We make the machines do what we need to do at the moment, but how do you sustain that? And how do you sustain that from an economic, environmental uh, perspective? The next video will give you a little bit of a glimpse into how the UAE is preparing technology from a sustainable perspective. Hiba, I'm going to turn it over to you and the video. Thank you very much for that, Hiba. And with that, we're now going to move into some of our presentations focusing around the technology aspect. Our first speaker that's going to be really looking at the aspect of how Dubai, in terms of its smart communities and smart initiative, uh, smart city initiatives, is presenting itself and positioning itself as a global thought leader. Our next speaker is the Director of Marketing for Smart Dubai. And more importantly, someone who's risen to the rank of leadership through a variety of marketing roles and a variety of thought leadership roles. From leading events such as GTEx to ensuring that Dubai has a front stage in many of the ICT conversations happening, not just in the MENA region, but globally, including in our relationships between Dubai and Canada. I'm gonna, I have the honor of welcoming Alia Almor, and as you can see on your screen, she's the Director of Marketing and Communications at Smart Dubai, and she's gonna be engaging you a little bit on uh, what Smart Dubai is up to and giving you some stats 
that will surely get you to think about not only how you can get involved, but more importantly, what do these stats mean to us in a post-COVID reality? Alia, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Ali, for that introduction. So happy to be here. And um, good morning in Canada and good afternoon, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, before I begin, I would uh, like to thank the Dubai FDI team for giving me and the rest of my colleagues from government and private sector from Dubai to, for this opportunity to show our guests today how Dubai is truly redefining its governance model. And in order to embrace the fourth industrial revolution, in order to establish itself as the innovation, startup, entrepreneurship, and digital capital of the MENA region. If we can just start to the next slide, please. So basically given birth to a very small initiative in our leadership executive office, Smart Dubai was given only one goal by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Vice President and Prime Minister of the UAE and ruler of Dubai, which is to make Dubai the happiest city on earth. I would not be surprised if some of you are now a bit confused as when I started the presentation, I was talking about innovation and the fourth industrial revolution. And how is all of this connected to happiness? Um, from day one, our vision was to build an inclusive, holistic, and most importantly, a citizen-centric smart city. In short, we are leveraging the power of technology to redesign everyday um, city experiences to, in order to ensure standard of living, leading to higher level of happiness amongst res residents and visitors of Dubai. Next slide, please. So, and some of you may know Dubai is uh, called home by people from over 200 nationalities. And as a government entity, how do we decide on strategies, initiatives, uh, legislations as well that are all equally and positively impact everyone? As a, as a solution to that, um, to that matter, in May 2016, we launched a scientific framework called the Dubai Happiness Agenda, which studies the various needs of people in the city uh, and also establishes a cultural baseline and helps us create policies and launch strategies uh, to solve some of the biggest everyday concerns of the average resident and visitor um, in Dubai. So what have we learned so far? If we can go to the next slide. The one after, please. So what we have learned from all of the learnings and by looking at the market and looking at everyone in Dubai, we looked at that from everything that we have established in the happiness agenda, it has helped us really understand and put together um, three primary roles for a government. And that's what we look into. So what a, role, what a role of government should be today is to transform citizen experiences, to embrace emerging technologies and to build a data ecosystem. Next slide, please. When the number one pain point that has been, to be honest, expressed by a lot of residents in Dubai um, is interacting with government services. And what are the, you know, the numerous service center visits, along with the long waiting uh, lines, the unnecessary travels, the piles of paperwork that they have to take from one entity to the other, and to precisely the, the time consuming tasks that are more importantly, not environmentally friendly at all. And as a government employee myself, I boldly say that, to be honest, in today's um, highly digitized uh, world, humans shouldn't be told to act as a data transfer tool for government entities. That's why, if we can go to the next slide, please. In uh, February 2018, uh, we have launched the Dubai Paperless Strategy. And uh, with the, the Dubai Paperless Strategy, it will ensure that all government to individual services uh, are 100% digital, with no paper uh, used for any internal process or customer facing transactions. And we envision that once we have completely digitized all of these services by the end of 2021, which is our deadline, we will annually eliminate the use of 1 billion pieces of paper, which totals up to 250 million US dollars in cost savings, as well as 125 million hours in time savings and also 130,000 trees in environmental savings um, every year. And just to put this into perspective, 130,000 trees is five times the size of the Central Park in New York. Next slides, please. So 
to be honest, like with, we have around 300 uh, services uh, right now that are being digitized. And we do not expect our residents and visitors to download over 300 different, different mobile applications. This is why Smart Dubai, uh, we have been working with all of the different government uh, Dubai entities, integrating and also digitizing their respective services in order to build a uniform look and feel for their digital presence. These services are today being offered through Dubai Now which is a single mobile and web application that will soon host all of the, the government to individual services. Currently, the application hosts over 120 services from more than 30 different government and the private sector entities as well. Examples of live services include renewal of card registration, which literally, it took me when, I, when I've done the uh, renewed my car myself, it took me literally less than six seconds. Um, which was amazing for me. And then you have the managing residency for everyone that's in the city, as well as to paying for petrol station in a contact, contactless manner, especially in this day and age. Uh, digitally enrolling children in schools and signing contracts, and also the latest COVID-19 updates, along with including safety measures that are taken by the Dubai government. All of it could be found on Dubai Now. Next slide, please. And due to the level of personal identification involved, as well as when accessing all of these city services, I am sure a lot of you are wondering how secure is this process? Um, therefore, in October 2018, and in partnership with the Telecom Regulatory Authority in the UAE, we have launched the UAE Pass. UAE Pass, it's a secure national digital identity of any resident of the UAE. It allows users not to just to digitally access all of the federal and local government services using a single login credentials. More importantly, the UAE Pass also provides users with a safe and secure digital signing capability, allowing them to sign all of their legal documents digitally. Next slide, please. Um, when we look into the you know, digitization as the best current term solution to transforming citizens' experiences, we apparently thought that to understand the power of emerging technologies such as blockchain and AI hold and, and how they are actually going to help cement Dubai as a digital capital of the region and the importance of it. If we can just go to the next slide, please. That's why, and with, with having that drive in mind, in October 2016, we launched the Dubai Blockchain Strategy. The Dubai Blockchain Strategy rests on three pillars, as you can see. The first one is government efficiency, and it talks about how we work with government and private sector partners where we want to identify the most impactful use cases that can be developed for the city. The second, the, the second pillar is industry creation, which is how to provide the infrastructure um, and like in a platform format and also looking into legal policies and network to build a blockchain ecosystem that can eventually self-sustain and keep growing in the future. The last one is international leadership, how we establish Dubai as a global leader in knowledge development and implementation of the blockchain technology. Next slide, please. In addition to blockchain and in alignment with the UAE's national AI strategy, Smart Dubai launched its own AI roadmap in order to identify and develop use cases for all AI implementations across the city of Dubai. These use cases cross all aspects of city services from police to security to land department, education, and as well as environmental services. The AI lab is a vital innovation testbed and important in building competency within government around this very fast paced technology. Through 2018, we ran 20 workshops where we have identified over 100 possible use cases for AI within Dubai government. We shortlisted the top 43 uh, use cases and today we are building proof of concepts and pilots for them in partnership with other government entities. Next slide, please. Once again, when with, with AI as well, as a, as a government entity, we want to make sure that we provide the right guidance for all entities implementing um, this emerging technology and to ensure that all AI, uh, all AI applications developed in Dubai are built in an ethical manner. That's why in January 2019, we launched the Ethical AI Toolkit, which includes uh, principles and guidelines to be followed for the ethical development of AI applications. Along with these guidelines, we have developed a self-assessment tool, which allows anyone implementing AI to self-assess their performance against a set of criteria. 
which when taken in together assures an, an incredibly ethical approach. The process uses the data from the self-assessment tool to create a positive feedback uh, with those that are all of them that are using the AI toolkit. And we believe we are the first city to set out such a voluntary approach that will help businesses and governments to create fair, explainable, accountable, and ultimately trusted AI systems that manage the tension between innovation and potential societal values. And for those interested basically in viewing, in viewing our guidelines, you can find our AI ethical toolkit on uh, www.smartdubai.ae. Next slide, please. Um, finally, uh, the last key activity we have been focusing on since the inception of Smart Dubai is building a holistic data ecosystem. It is commonly known um, and agreed upon that data is the fuel of the future and therefore a key ingredient for the growth of emerging technology applications and the ongoing development of smart cities. We can think of several applications of emerging technologies, but with, without having the right data sets to feed the applications, we really can't go too far with them. Next slide, please. So looking into all of the full potential of data, we can deliver great value for the city. And in Dubai, we have taken all an inclusive approach to build the city's data ecosystem, looking into data governance, infrastructure, and ecosystem engagement. We have created data sharing policies for the government and private sector and built Dubai Pulse, which is an open data sharing platform that hosts around 600 different government data sets, which can be accessed by anyone across the globe. We are also soon launching a decentralized data platform to encourage the exchange of data between government and the private sector. Next slide. Um, as knowledge sharing is a key pillar of Smart Dubai, I would like to conclude by inviting you all to join the Smart Cities Global Network, which brings together leading smart city experts, government leaders, academia, NGOs, and other individuals on one platform to discuss the best practices in smart city building uh, and whatever is being implemented across the globe. Um, and again, thanks all for having us here today and having us as part of the webinar and giving me the time to take you through the Smart Dubai uh, and Dubai's digital uh, journey. To, yeah, digital journey and transformation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Alia. And I think to our audience and to you, not only do I thank you, but it comes as no surprise that uh, you were nominated amongst the promising 40 under 40 UAE nationals. Uh, a very yes, succinct presentation, uh, very, very well put together. And I think I'll just take a minute to sort of summarize three very important elements to that. Uh, firstly, was this aspect of your understanding around uh, blockchain and security. I mean, we often say right, blockchain is uh, mathematical proof that something happened. Um, and you, you correlated it very well with the cybersecurity element of identity and how do you secure users online. Identity is the new perimeter in security. Uh, and I think those elements of how Dubai is focusing on authenticating people online is, is a very important initiative and has a lot of innovations there within it. So I really encourage folks to think about new cybersecurity practices. Second, uh, I think, you know, we, in, in Canada, we say this a lot that you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. Uh, and yes. I think Dubai is creating a very strong test bed for such innovations. When you have risk averse, but not necessarily risk averse, but you have less risky environments where you can test different implementations like blockchain, like AI, I think uh, you find a perfect test bed. So for those of you who are looking to test out new technologies, I think with 200 nationals there, Dubai gives you a very localized environment to go global. Um, and I think our friends, for example, Maddie Reza from CyberX will have a lot to say on that. And I'm sure he'll be interested in connecting with you. Uh, and lastly, I think it's, it's really important for our audience to also understand that aspect of data. I say this all the time, that if AI is the rocket, data is the fuel. And these initiatives around open data uh, are not easy to perfect. So I really congratulate you on how far you've come in a very, very short period of time. And once again, uh, Dubai settling for nothing less than first place. Alia, once again, thank you very much. And now I have the honor of introducing Salman Jafri, who is the Chief Business Development Officer at the Dubai International Financial Center. His uh, career has taken him across the world, including in North America. And in Dubai, he has a track record of attracting some major businesses and building uh, trust and more importantly, integrity uh, around investments into Dubai. Integrity never goes out of style and uh, Salman is someone who can certainly speak to that. 
Uh, his background also goes into Islamic finance, into other areas of financial innovations. And he's been educated in North America as well and is doing some phenomenal things in Dubai. So Salman, without any further ado, I'm gonna ask you to turn on your video and uh, the digital stage is, is all yours. Salman, welcome and over to you. Super, thanks, thanks Ali. Uh, first of all, I just wanna make sure that people can, can see me or hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, super. Oh, I think I'm... Well, um, for, uh, thank you uh, to Dubai FDI and to all the organizers for putting together uh, this conversation uh, today. It is an absolute pleasure to be part of it, um, primarily because this is in fact a, a Team Dubai production. And, and I suppose um, by way of introduction, uh, the role that the Dubai International Financial Center plays in the context of today's conversation is one of sector development, job creation, and GDP growth. And so then you might ask the question, well, what is the role of technology in it? And it, it's probably worth uh, setting the stage, which is, we were established um, 16 years ago with the sole purpose of diversifying uh, Dubai's economy uh, and the UA's economy away from hydrocarbons. And that, that model has, has been very successful, manifest in the fact that um, today, from scratch, uh, 25,000 people uh, work here every day. There are over 2,600 companies. And anywhere, anywhere between 45 to 5.5% of Dubai's GDP growth uh, comes from our contribution. So clearly by any measure of success, the model of um, aggregating capital and talent in a way that drives economic growth has worked. Um, but what, what, what we're now seeing is uh, a consolidated uh, uh, attempt by the organizations um, on this call, ourselves, Smart Dubai, Dubai Future Foundation, of course, Dubai FDI, to work together and figure out what that next wave of growth is. So that's the context for, for today's conversation. In the interest of time and to make sure that we get into the q and I'll zip through some slides for context. Uh, if you could go to the first slide, please. So the first two slides set the stage for why is it that Dubai is interesting and why companies come here. Look, the 30 second version of, of the story that we all know intuitively for Dubai being a crossroads economy is that we are a platform for a very large um, uh, business case or market opportunity. And that essentially is because of the fact that the demographic pyramids in this region, Middle East, Africa, South Asia, are inverted relative to North America, Europe, and even the Far East. And what that simply means is that you have uh, a lot of people, north of 2 billion people, of whom a significant population are young, who are gonna be consuming all kinds of financial and non-financial services and infrastructure and healthcare for not just 10 years, but 20, 30, and 40 years. And collectively, that explains the importance of having the right platform to access those markets. Next slide, please. And so that is necessary, but not sufficient for success, right? So you can have all these great markets around you. And what does that really mean? Well, the leadership, as Ali talked about, um, whether it was Sheikh Zayed or, or Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, um, identified the UAE's unique position. And indeed the leadership here uh, created a, a model that allows Dubai to, to access this. And essentially, I'm gonna summarize again in just a few seconds what, what the thrust of that, of that platform is. You've gotta have a place that's forward-looking, that's business-oriented, that's business-friendly, that has amazing soft and hot infrastructure and that attracts people, right? Ultimately, top people have to wanna to come here, stay here and work. And when they work here and they stay here and they bring up their families here, that creates economic growth. So it's very straightforward. And across all those metrics, uh, the details of which will be made available in the deck, Dubai and the UAE rank exceptionally well. Very, very important. If we can move to the next slide, please. Okay, so the pivot point for today is naturally uh, COVID um, has brought into attention something that many of us in Dubai, uh, um, Team Dubai have seen, which is, you know, it, it's, it's accelerated the ongoing conversation on digitizing the economy. And so there's many elements. There's the operational uh, digitization of, uh, of companies to drive efficiencies. There is the personal digitization, but effectively, right? The idea is that there is this incredible enablement. And I think that agenda is now front and center. Next slide, please. 
Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, let, let, let's skip this one for a sec. Okay. So essentially, right, I've talked about the market opportunity. I've talked about Dubai as, as an incredible platform. Um, I skipped over some stats that drive home the point that there's an incredible digital, uh, digital um, opportunity. Um, when you have a young population that has is underpenetrated for digital services and yet ha is very is very digital savvy, there's a great opportunity to 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 uh, to provide digital services. And because we're a financial center, our first foray into this has been to focus on financial technology. And because of this amazing enablement, I, actually this data has to be updated. My bad. Um, you know, we know the numerator, we don't know the, the denominator, but we have north of 50 to almost 60% market share in FinTech. So there's probably now, I'm guessing 420, 430 FinTech firms. We now have 230 today um, already in the DIFC and we'll probably end the year at 250, 260. And so what that means is that we've been able to attract global and regional talent in this space to address the opportunity. That's really significant for, for a couple of reasons that I'll share with you. Next slide, please. And so what uh, um, part of how we've done that is essentially, uh, there's three things we did, right? We changed the regs. So we had the, the regions first, the regs on, on, on crowdfunding. We launched the regions first accelerator called FinTech High. We did partnerships with Startup Bootcamp. We launched a $100 million fund. Um, a lot of cool things happened. And essentially now people think of DIFC and Dubai as the place that's going to drive innovation. Next slide, please. Now I've talked about innovation. I, I failed to mention as I was glossing over the, the last 16 years that in the conventional or traditional financial services space, one of the reasons why we're able to scale in financial technology is when you're able to scale in, 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 in traditional business. We could not have replicated the success in the innovation space had we not been able to replicate or, or aggregate the best people in the world in financial services, asset management, insurance, and as, uh, as well as, you know, the law firms and the consulting firms the ecosystem. So that's really, really critical. Next slide, please. One of the messages that you'll hear uh, in, this, uh, in this panel is the importance of institutions and the importance uh, of laws and regs and transparency. I can't stress enough um, the fact that none of this works without the secret sauce of transparency of the legal and regulatory system, right? Financial services is the most regulated business in the world. No financial services company would ever dream of picking up and changing locations unless they had absolute confidence that the contracts that they have are worth the paper they're, they're, they're printed on, or of course today they're, they're, di they're digital. And of course the, the regs and the laws have to, have to work and you have to have recourse when things don't work. We've been through now two down cycles. The center has survived and thrived. And so this is absolutely critical. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm, I'm in the last third of, uh, of the discussion. I've talked about the history, okay? We've, we've built up this incredible aggregated uh, talent pool and capital pool with our traditional business. The last four years, we've enjoyed tremendous success with FinTech. What's next? Well, cycles have gotten smaller and smaller. So FinTech was the absolute right place to get into the digital game. But exactly that's the point. The point is that we will continue to go deep in, in, in FinTech. And now we're looking more holistically alongside my Team Dubai colleagues at, at, at looking at technologies and business models that, that are gonna digitize the regional economies, including Dubai's, and that's the play. And so we have made a commitment to focus in not just on a FinTech, but on the future of finance. And essentially the summary of the slide is that we're gonna continue not just to be a platform, but to drive innovation and to help drive business value. It's not good enough to give someone a license and space. You've got to connect the dots. You've got to create the platform. You've got to enable business. And that's the vision that we're going forward with. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a, a reminder, you know, why? why? Why on earth would we do this? This is not to say, by the way, for naysayers, this is not the end of traditional financial services. This slide does not talk about the fact that banking is finished or traditional insurance is gone. What this is referring to is the rate of growth is fundamentally different, okay? And that the future, the, the new tech, the growth firms, the new jobs, we think are gonna come from future of finance. 
That's the key message here. And that's going to be underpinned by core technologies. You know, as Ali may have mentioned, think about our, our, our uh, digital agenda is that it's technology agnostic, right? So we're about finding the right technologies and platforms to solve the problems that are most pressing for us. And so blockchain, with the exception of the cryptocurrency uh, use case, is generally and widely accepted and utilized here in, in, in Dubai. AI is going to be we're one of the few countries in the world, uh, Ali, if not the only one, probably one of the few that has obviously a ministry dedicated to it. So, so the core underlying R&D and technology is super important here. Next slide, please. All right, uh, let me, this is the penultimate slide. This gives you a sense of the bets that we're making. Um, a quick sampling for you is, I'll give you one example, right? A bunch of really cool things here in future finance, including digital banking and, 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 and tokenization, digital assets. Payments is one great example, which links all the things I've said. So because we're a Miasa platform, guess what? We have, we are, we the, the GCC and, and the UAE, we are at the giving end of one of the five biggest payments corridors in the world because we have labor, uh, we have people who work here who send money back to India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Philippines, okay? And guess what? Um, the fintech entrepreneurs would, would tell you that banks don't do it as well as they could. And so then we have this explosion of uh, different business models in the retail and in the wholesale space that have found really, really amazing, cost-effective and efficient ways to do this. This is a great example. The only other thing I'll say to you is that digital banking is coming and payments is gonna be the gateway to it. Uh, one, other, one other observation, Islamic finance is really important for Dubai and the DIFC. And I'm, I'm delighted to say that the innovation that we're seeing in traditional finance is also happening in Islamic finance. Let's, let's skip the last slide, please, and skip the next slide and go to the last slide. Let's skip, yeah. Let me, let me conclude with a message of, of collaboration. Uh, you know, none of this happens unless um, organizations are aligned and work together, both when it comes to standards, regulations, ease of business, platforms, data sharing. And I can tell you, I'm so proud that um, Dubai has, is coming together um, collectively with unity on the simple premise that because we are a forward-looking society, that the absolute best growth and the best opportunities are yet to come. And I'm so excited at the prospect of working with all of you guys to make this happen for Dubai. Thanks for your time. Salman, thank you very much for your time and enlightening us with a number of perspectives as it applies to how finances ultimately impact not only what we invest in, but also how we grow the businesses that we have in our community. It's not just about putting money at the table, but people at the table and context at the table. You know, when, when you were talking, I was uh, remembering a talk I gave about uh, three weeks ago where uh, I just said, listen, you know, Google it up and uh, you'll hear that Starbucks is not just a coffee company, it's a data company. And you really need to understand how these organizations are stepping into the tech world. And I think you've, again, in, in sort of building that bridge from Alia is you've shown how the context has been created um, in Dubai. So thank you very much uh, for doing that. You know, often when you do, you look at these economic results, you, uh, you look at them and say, wow, it's telling me that the best time of purchase was last year. So instead of thinking uh, reactively to the economy, you think proactively. And I think there'll be quite a few questions that come up to you from a COVID perspective and how things are moving forward, as well as from a cryptocurrency perspective. Ships are safe in a harbor, but that's not what ships are for. So thank you so much for enlightening us uh, with your talk. We're now gonna go into one of the final presentations of today. And this is from uh, Saeed al Falasi, who is the executive director of the Dubai Future Foundation. If you go onto their website, you'll see a quote from uh, Sheikh Mohammed there, which is the future is not for those who await it, but for those who create it. And if you take some time to look at the Dubai Future Foundation's program, you'll see projects around smart mobility, you'll see projects around access to finance, you'll see projects around mentorship. And uh, it's really about how the ecosystem has been created to create a little bit of a nice soft landing for those who want to participate in the, the, the Dubai economy and innovate. So Saeed, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, you have the stage to talk a little bit more about what the Dubai Future Foundation does 
and hopefully at the end take some questions. Saeed, uh, the, the video and the audio is over to you. Thank you so much, Ali. Uh, it's always a great honor to be a uh, part of the Dubai team uh, members. Uh, I'd like to thank as well uh, FDI for their efforts and bringing everything together. Um, and it's, it was quite interesting. I mean, you will see a couple of, uh, couple of uh, uh, themes that's coming across from our different presentations. We get quite inspired by our leadership in terms of how we are actually preparing ourselves uh, for the future. Um, the Dubai Future Foundation is not an old uh, government entity. It's just been around for the last three to four years. And um, one of the major events that, that, that we have in the city is the, uh, is the Dubai Government Summit. It's a summit that really invites uh, approximately, I would say, thousands of uh, politicians, technologists, uh, and you name it, uh, into one space to have a conversation about different topics, not necessarily around uh, politics, but it's, it's about softer topics like uh, uh, how would AI look uh, in the future? Um, how is, how, what is the well-being of humans around all these different technologies? So it's inter really interesting conversations. And on the side of this uh, government summit, we always had this small exhibition and what we called at the time, the, uh, the future museum. And within that museum, we had exhibits around robotics and um, how can it help and aid the senior citizens. We always had some exhibits that really it's out there, but it gets you thinking. And that's what was quite important for us. Uh, we had uh, how AI can enable government services. We had uh, how can blockchain really enhances the way that we transact within government. But we had that museum open um, at every iteration of the government summit. And I think by the third year, His Highness uh, Sheikh Mohammed, the, uh, uh, the ruler of Dubai and the vice president of the prime, prime minister of uh, UAE came in and said, look guys, you've been telling me how the future is gonna look like uh, in the future. And uh, what he said, if this is how the future, the way that you explain it to me, it's going to look like, I'd like, to, I'd like for us to be quite prepared for it. So the way that he wanted us to be prepared for it is by establishing the Dubai Future Foundation. Uh, next slide, please. So that led us to create the Dubai Future Foundation and it's, it was really to institutionalize the future shaping of Dubai. Uh, and it was a way to put us together to start thinking and planning for the future. Future planning is not a new topic, but it was to put a government department through that process is quite unique for us. Uh, when we try to bench, uh, benchmark ourselves and try to see what government entities that exist elsewhere in the world and trying to see how we can actually benchmark ourselves, what kind of services that we would provide, how things we, how, how we're going to do things differently, we really didn't find a whole lot. So we had to really continue to work through making Dubai a test lab and really create that sandbox for us to say, you know what, let's try different things, let's make mistakes, but I think we will all benefit from it, whether it's, it's a succeeds uh, or it fails. The next slide, please. So we set up our mission as a Dubai Future Foundation is to really to collectively imagine, inspire, and design Dubai's future. And this is a real true inspiration of our leadership. Uh, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed has always said that in order for us, as people, as a city, as a country, to be prepared for the future, we have to first imagine it, design it, and really execute it. Our vision has always been to be one of the leading cities uh, in the future. Next slide, please. So as an organization, the way that we decided that we wanted to set up ourselves, we really took that inspiration of imagining and designing and executing and we put together multiple different initiatives and programs that will help us get through that. And if you see the different pockets in front of you on the screen, if we start off by imagining, we really wanted to understand first, what, if, what is the future is holding for us? Is it about technology? How would technology really inspire us? How would it affect us? We really wanted to have a peek around the corner and try to understand what is coming our way. How can we utilize technology in a different way? And in order for us to do that, we created the Dubai Future Research. And we really worked very closely with the uh, World Economic Forum into establishing the Center for uh, the Fourth Industrial Revolution to really focus on very specific topic, uh, such as medicine, blockchain, AI. We really wanted to create our own research around these topics 
to better understand it and to also better react to it. And that was quite important for us as a city uh, uh, if we wanted to lead that segment uh, in a way. At the same time, we understood that with all that knowledge and with all that know-how, we needed to somehow make all that information, if you were to say, public friendly. Uh, so disseminating that knowledge was quite important in our radar as well. Uh, we worked very closely with the, with, the, with the popular science, the MIT Technology Review. We understood at the time also that a lot of the information about technology uh, and about the future and utilization of technology is mainly available in English. And it's easy for somebody who speaks English uh, can get online and get that information. We understood that the Middle East with the, with the Arabic language, there was a true barrier. And technology is really not, nobody owns it. So we wanted to make sure that we translate that content into the Arabic language and make it available to everybody across the Middle East and every other city that speaks Arabic. We wanted to make sure that the knowledge and information around technology is, is, is available to them. That's, that's when it comes to the imagining and, and understanding what the future is all about. Now, designing the future, we, know, we knew that we wanted to focus into building our capacity to make sure that we have the right government, government employees that will know exactly what technology is, how can they interact with entrepreneurs from across the world when, they, when it comes to technology. Uh, so that led us to the creation of the Dubai Future Academy. The Future Academy, it was one of the first institutes that really focused on future foresight and what does that actually mean. Uh, we had a couple of, couple of rounds of courses that really enlisted different government departments, employees, to make sure that we actually let them know what the future is going to hold and how can they have the right planning tools to be able to understand and, and take all the knowledge that they see online or the, the research that we produce, how can they, that really impact them in the way that they operate and also in the way that they can provide services to the public and to the private sector. The other initiative, which I'm truly proud of, it's called the One Million Arab Coder. The One Million Arab Coder, it's, it's a, I wouldn't call it, it's a competition. It's, a, it's, a, it's an initiative that came from His Highness Sheikh Mohammed saying simply that coding and data is the essence of everything that's going to come in the future. And this is something that is not for UAE, it's not for Dubai, it's for the whole Arab world. We wanted to make sure that we create an online platform that allows all the uh, Arab residents from across of different countries to actually enlist, to sign up for classes, to really start programming and understand how they can use data around it. And in the first year, we had literally thousands of graduates, those who actually enlisted in courses, graduated from them. We had a lot of inspiring stories. We had people from Jordan, from Syria, those who were in, in refugee camps, they got the chance to get a laptop, get an access to that website, start coding uh, for websites. And now they went from not knowing anything about programming all the way to actually producing websites. So now they can actually provide for their families. That was a byproduct of what we wanted to do, but that was kind of inspiring to us. Uh, this initiative specifically got more uh, traction as well. We, we, uh, we worked very closely with the Egyptian government, Jordanian government, uh, the Kazakhstans, uh, as well as Uzbekistan to translate that initiative into their own countries as well to make sure that they actually get the benefit of uh, what a platform would, uh, would look like. Now, uh, on, on the design side, uh, we, we, we wanted to make sure that to continue making Dubai a testbed and experimenting and piloting with new technologies is essential to advancing any, any, any new technology. And we have we had programs like the Dubai Future Accelerator. This is a unique program where actually it identified the challenges that different government and private companies in Dubai and try to match, make it with companies from across the world to make sure that they answer for these challenges utilizing their technology. I will provide some examples in the, in the, in the next slides to make it easier as well. Uh, I think we can move to the next slide, please. So for us, as a city, as Dubai, and, and a way for us to continue progress, we wanted to make sure that that test bed is quite essential. We wanted that thought to be embedded in everything that we do, from government to private, from citizens to residents. And we wanted to make sure that everybody acknowledge and know that testing is fine. 
There will be mistakes that's going to happen, but there's a lot of learnings that are going to come through. And, and the, 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 this is part of our DNA as a city as well. Uh, in the late 70s, when uh, His Highness Sheikh Rashid bin Saeed decided to build uh, a seaport in the middle of the desert, a lot of people told him, I think that's a crazy idea. How can you build uh, a seaport in the middle of the desert and literally you have no trade at the time? And today, that Jebel Ali port actually stands as one of the busiest seaports across the globe and actually manage and operate over 80 ports across the world. So that kind of risk that we are willing to take and we're willing to learn from is quite uh, vital to our, uh, our survival as a city as well. Uh, next slide, please. So all these initiatives that you've seen, uh, that you've seen in the previous slide, we put them all into one space. So it's easy for people to recognize, to visit, to interact with the different talents and experts within, within different fields. And we call the area, Area 2071. It's actually marks the, 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 the 100 years of establishment of, of UAE. And our vision for that is really to be one of the leading cities by 2071. It's quite ambitious for us, but we wanted to make a physical representation of that. And at least it's always on our mind of where we're heading. Uh, next slide, please. We'll move to the next slide. So one of the main tasks that we, we, we do in, uh, in the Y Future Foundation is to make sure that we are transforming ideas into experiments and pilots. We, I, I probably mentioned this now three times already, but just to show you how important that is and, and how much work that needs to go behind it to make sure that it happens on the ground. It, it touches on regulation. And if you want to, if you want to work with AI and you want to work with drones, uh, you want to work with blockchain, you understand that there's a lot of regulation that might stop it. We want to be the city that actually allows you to do that. And we created different programs specifically for that. Uh, next slide, please. So the Dubai Future Accelerator that I wanted to touch on uh, a little bit earlier, um, we are running, uh, on January, we'll be running the cohort number eight. Uh, this is where we basically ensure that we partnership with the best government departments, understand their requirements and challenges, and make sure that we are tied them or uh, uh, tie them with the best companies uh, from across the globe. Since we started that program, we've had over 255 participating companies, uh, over 90 pilot projects that have been launched. Uh, and I was looking on our data, and as a matter of fact, we had uh, over seven companies, specifically from Canada. Uh, the, 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 kind of, uh, the kind of work that they did with us is very specific to uh, education and health, uh, those seven companies. And luckily, at least they've signed a memorandum of understanding with the government department. So uh, I'm also, I wanted to touch base with them uh, probably by next week to understand how, where are they actually now in terms of piloting and experimenting with those projects. But this is, this is, the, this is quite, quite important to understand that not a lot of government departments across the world will allow startups or entrepreneurs to come and test technology with them. In any country, the, the government are the biggest buyers. And in Dubai specifically, we've seen that since the 70s, the government departments or the government are actually leading on research and development, which allows them to really touch base with the best knowledge and uh, knowledgeable companies and most innovative technological companies from across the globe. So this is quite an interesting program. We, we often put our challenges uh, on our website, dubaifuture.ae. So please feel free to log into that website. You will see the challenges by different government departments. You can apply uh, on our website and be part of this uh, amazing experience. Next slide, please. So some of the companies that worked with us in the past, uh, we had, for example, a, comp a company called Loyal. They worked very closely with Emirates Airlines specifically around creating a platform for loyalty and rewards. Uh, and it wasn't only for their, uh, for their, uh, for the, it wasn't meant for the consumers or the customers, but it meant actually for internal, uh, for internal uh, employees. Uh, and it was quite an interesting uh, thought from Emirates Airlines, and it was a different way of challenging themselves as well to make the workplace quite exciting uh, for them. Uh, we worked with solar bankers who worked very closely with the Dubai Electrical and Water Authority, specifically around solar energy. 
uh, it was their first project outside their country, so they were quite excited to be to be experimenting with, the new, with their new technology with the, uh, an amazing uh, government entity. And we worked very closely also with Smart Dubai, which Ali is presenting here today, uh, really into managing uh, warehouses. Uh, most of, as as you might as you might imagine, a lot of the government departments have warehouses uh, for the last 20, 30 years, and you can imagine how many items in those. So we wanted to digitalize that whole process and make sure that we squeeze that time into finding items in those warehouses. Uh, so Smart Dubai was very helpful working with us and the Dubai Health Authority, making sure that we take the startup, work on the technology, make sure that it actually pilot that project and make sure that it's successful to be able to expand it into all the other uh, government entities. Uh, like I said earlier, I mean, the Dubai Future Accelerator program is an exciting program because it really allows uh, SMEs and young companies and even even well-established companies to come to Dubai to experiment with, the, with their technology. Uh, next slide, please. I've touched on the regulation lab uh, a bit uh, earlier. Uh, we, have a, we have a website uh, for as well. Uh, you can quickly Google it. Uh, we are allowing companies uh, to submit uh, for their technologies and uh, we understood that during this time that there is a lot of companies who want to experiment experiment with the uh, with drones or, or ai or blockchain or, or you name it and uh, a lot of countries will not have the right regulation around it so we are allowing through this uh, platform for companies to come and apply to experiment with their technology and uh, we provide them with a minimum viable license that will allow them actually to execute it on the on the ground whether it's uh, autonomous driving or any other uh, technology so it's a, an interesting platform for uh, companies uh, from uh, from different parts of the world as well and and with this one i will conclude the, the presentation and uh, i'll be around for any questions anybody might have hey thank you very much for that and uh, as i always tell my team when i speak to them here in canada is that uh, innovation and investments in innovation is not about what's the next product on the shelf. It's about, do we even need the shelf altogether? And I think you've really pointed to all of those items very, very succinctly and clearly. And, and for me, what really stood out was this Dubai regulations lab, not only because uh, I just watched the social dilemma, but because of something that you said later on, which is this aspect of many countries do not have this. And how do you regulate ethical development of new technologies that are governed on data to trust that people don't become the product? So Saeed, thank you very much for that. We have another 20 odd minutes left, and I know we have Al on the agenda to talk a little bit about the Dubai FDI at Dubai Advantage. So Al, uh, you're in need of no introduction. You've been the star behind the show, behind the scenes. Thank you for your work. Al, I'm gonna turn it over to you before we turn over to Q&A. Al, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ali. I'm gonna try and run through this a little bit, uh, a little bit quickly. Um, and this is more of a presentation that talks a little bit about the ecosystem of Dubai and some of the different sectors that we have here. Okay, they're just highlights that, uh, that we've chosen to uh, present tonight. Next slide, please. Next slide, there we go. Okay, so G, uh, Dubai's GDP in, in, in distribution for uh, 2018, uh, as you can see from the, the slide being presented, is, is very varied. Uh, Dubai itself uh, has less than 2% um, oil. And as a result, the, uh, the economy is very diverse here. Everything from manufacturing to uh, financial services and uh, real estate, uh, uh, the logistics side, which is the storage and transportation there, uh, the wholesale uh, and, and retail area. These are some of the areas that are, are very, very strong for, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, Dubai economy. Next slide, please. And one of the things about Dubai is that we are very uniquely positioned uh, in, in, the, in the global, global uh, space. Uh, from Dubai, within roughly a seven hour flight, uh, you can reach about 2.4 billion consumers. And that is reaching folks in the CIS, it's the, the GCC, the Greater MENA region, uh, and, and of course the African continent as well. So there's a very large capture area from here. And uh, one of the things that, that we always say is, is that uh, between here and India, there are four gateways out of uh, the UAE into 16 gateways in India. And in normal times, uh, there's over 1,160 flights a week. 
uh, between these two jurisdictions. So there's, you know, everything from freight to, uh, to passenger services uh, for both places. But of course, the fact is, is that all these areas that we're, we're talking about are within uh, a similar time zone difference. There might be a, a one, possibly a two hour time difference, but that would be about it. And of course, now we have the new advent of the recently signed uh, UAE-Israel um, uh, treaty, uh, the Abraham Accords as it's called. And that will, will open up brand new markets. Next slide, please. So here we have in our, in our uh, uh, logistics side with aviation and, and, and con um, connectivity, uh, just to show you a little bit about how much freight comes through Dubai. Uh, you know, 3.4 million tons of air freight uh, moved in 2019. And our airlines here, uh, 140 different destinations. And uh, you can see how busy our airport is. Uh, over 8,000 flights uh, uh, weekly through Dubai. Next. Next. So one of the things that we have coming up, and of course it was postponed due to the, uh, the COVID pandemic that, uh, that the world is currently facing, uh, is Expo 2020. That is the World's Fair, and it's the first time this fair has ever been held in the MENA region. That is the Middle East, North African region. And we expect somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 million visitors to it uh, with the theme of connecting minds uh, and creating the future. And mobility, sustainability, and opportunity are part of the theming of, uh, of Expo coming up. And anyone that happens to be interested in Expo uh, activity, uh, if you go to the Expo 2020 uh, website, there is a portal there for you to uh, register on as, as a provider or provisioner of services or goods. Next slide, please. So our trade, our trade for the first quarter of 2020 is about $87.9 billion. And that is pretty well on track for uh, what, is the, what has been happening since the uh, 2016 to the 2019 area. We're pretty even uh, right across the board as, as the years go on. Next slide, please. So our infrastructure is not only the, uh, uh, the airport and the seaport that we have here, which the Jebel Ali uh, seaport is the 10th largest port in the world. Uh, we also have invested heavily in infrastructure that is, I'll call hard infrastructure, okay? That is the, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, light rail transit that we have here. And we've invested a lot of money in it, over $100 billion or 100 billion dirhams in it, I'm sorry. Uh, right now it runs uh, about 75 kilometers. It's driverless. We've just been doing some extensions of it from the, uh, um, the main line out to the expo site. And that, uh, that is just about ready. Um, so we've, passengers are, are growing every year and it is the, uh, it's a very attractive uh, investment that has, uh, uh, has seen in Dubai over the last number of years. Next slide, please. So the Dubai plan 2021 that we have um, has six different principles to it. That is securing a cultural and, and uh, entertaining place to live. Uh, we have certainly a very pro-business uh, and, and investment destination. Um, this year, because of COVID, there's been a number of incentives that have been uh, uh, offered by different free zones, by the government, what have you. And anyone that is interested in finding those uh, incentives, if you go to www.dubaifdimonitor.ae, you'll find um, uh, in one of the tabs there, uh, the incentives that are, are available. So it's a very proactive government, uh, very innovative, as you've heard from our previous presenters. A uh, very vibrant and, and tolerant and inclusive uh, multicultural society. I mentioned about the Abraham Accords a few moments ago, uh, a big deal. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, Mr. Trump has been taking a lot of credit on it. I think last year in February when, uh, when the Pope visited Abu Dhabi and had a, uh, a mass out there, uh, they laid the cornerstones for uh, a, a mosque, a synagogue, and a church 
And that I think was the, the very, very beginnings of, of the, uh, the program along with uh, the year of tolerance over the last couple of years. Uh, so we have a very smart and sustainable and healthy uh, living environment and of course offer sustainable and economic growth. Next slide, please. So smart cities, I don't need to tell you a whole lot about that because Alia is the, uh, the guru here on, uh, on smart cities, but just to, it's safe to say that over a hundred initiatives have been launched within the government uh, on, uh, on uh, smart services. And uh, uh, we've, we've moved to hundred uh, percent paperless uh, for 20, uh, 2021. Next slide, please. And all of this is, of course, part of the, the happiness uh, 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 program that we have going. And uh, so here we have the blockchain, blockchain strategy, uh, eliminating uh, 100 million uh, uh, paper transactions that I think uh, Salman spoke a little bit about uh, the, the payment gateways and what have you. Uh, the first ever uh, government to execute uh, blockchain for all its transactions and uh, uh, we're just gonna to continue to drive forward uh, with all the different technologies that are out there. And of course, Smart Dubai has been very uh, forward thinking and very helpful in, in driving uh, the, the government economies here on uh, moving forward in technology. Next slide, please. So there's been a fair bit of you know, investment uh, in uh, fixed lines and, and, and open uh, data laws and, and what have you. Um, you know, it was close to 18.2 uh, million active mobile subscriptions here in the UAE. Consider that there's a, you know, a population of uh, somewhere in the neighborhood, just under 10 million uh, uh, people in the UAE. And that's quite a, uh, uh, a large number of uh, subscriptions. 4.8 billion in technology for, for Internet of Things, uh, which contributes to the economy during 2020. Next slide, please. So AI, again, uh, the previous speaker spoke quite a bit about that, and you can see the different sectors here that have adopted it, uh, where, where, where money is being spent. Uh, financial services, the healthcare sector is a huge one that's adopting it with robotics and, and uh, surgeries and what have you. Uh, the logistics sector with transportation storage, construction, of course, is doing it, and now, uh, of course, education with edutech programs. Next slide, please. The green technology, of course, is, is, is a lot of uh, high technologies that are going in. We've got the, the largest uh, solar plant in the world uh, at 5,000 megawatts. Uh, there's continuance of investment in that in, in other areas as well. Uh, as you can see from the slide, 13.7 billion to be invested further in, in the plant by uh, 2030. Next slide, please. Part of this uh, investment in um, clean energy is to see us move to a 75% uh, green energy usage by the year 2050. Right now we're only at about 7%, but we're moving very rapidly towards um, uh, the 75%. Uh, earlier this year, uh, I guess last month it was, we just brought on our nuclear power plant here. So this will start uh, helping out with uh, further investment in, uh, in green technologies. Next slide, please. So we're targeting a 40% increase in, in the knowledge base uh, here in, in Dubai. In the various sectors, we've got the space sector, we've had um, um, our first astronaut uh, for the UAE uh, travel to uh, the International Space Station a couple of months ago. Uh, last month in, or in July, we, uh, we launched the uh, uh, spacecraft Hope on its way to uh, Mars. It's one of the three uh, probes that are heading that way. Uh, innovation incubators, academic research centers, uh, the aviation sector, of course, which is a very large sector for, uh, for Dubai, uh, clean energy projects, renewables, uh, and R&D course, it's a big priority here as well. Next slide, please. Banking finance. Um, I, I, I don't need to say too much about that. Our, my, my colleague Solomon 
has already spoken about it. Uh, the rankings here, as you can see, 2019, we we're number eight at the Global Financial Center Index. Um, there's over 2,400 uh, uh, companies registered in the DIFC. Solomon was saying that that number has somewhat increased uh, a little bit. Um, and the DIFC courts, so the comment I will make about this is that if you are doing business in, in Dubai, in the UAE, um, you might want to consider adding in uh, your contract for uh, the use of the DIF courts for arbitration and the DIFC laws uh, for uh, the governing law of your contract. The uh, DIFC law follows UK common law and um, I think you'll find that that is a little bit better for you to consider. Next slide. Uh, uh, Salman again spoke about the Islamic economy and uh, Dubai aims to be the capital thereof. Uh, 393.1 billion market capitalization um, in the D Dubai financial market in 2019, the 10th largest international financial center uh, ranking by Banker Magazine with a $54.4 billion market capitalization. Next slide, please. And in manufacturing, uh, carry on, uh, we've got six different sectors that we are focusing on as part of the Dubai plan, aerospace, maritime, pharmaceuticals and medical equipment, the aluminum and fabricated metals, fast moving consumer goods, that's your retail, your restaurants, and what have you, and machinery and equipment. Next slide, please. Healthcare is a, a major area of investment uh, in technology, uh, capacity building, education, um, and, so, and so on. And tr the, the training side of the course is, is a huge area. We're spending just under $20 billion in, uh, in, in healthcare this year. Uh, the Center of Excellence for uh, Cardiology project is out at the moment uh, for, for, for bidding, I believe. Uh, um, it's in its RFQ stage, of, uh, I think it's the current status. Uh, the sector value of the UAE market is expected to be about 28 billion in 2021. That's just next year, folks. Um, and it's, so it's a very high priority of investments that, that uh, are coming up. If you go to the CBC's uh, website on YouTube, and look at the business uh, programs, you'll see that we did have a previous webinar on healthcare. Uh, the Dubai Health Authority and the Dubai Healthcare City were both uh, uh, participating in it along with Dubai Science Park. And you can have a look at some of the stuff that uh, these folks have had to say. Next slide, please. And that is a wrap on that and Ali, uh, sorry, I know I'm just running over, over time just a bit, but if we could take a few minutes for questions uh, at, our at our final video and closing. Absolutely. So I think uh, the first question, Ali, is kind of directed to you, and I'll ask you to keep your answers brief, but of course, uh, our audience can reach out directly to some of our speakers and to Al and his team if you have any follow-up questions. And Ali, this question is referring to the AI ethics piece. And it's more along the lines of how did you go about creating governance around AI? Did you put together an advisory group from around the world? Did you put together an interdisciplinary sector representation? How did you form that think tank around AI? Alia, if you can unmute and try and tackle that question. Hopefully we have Alia on. Yes, yes, hi Ali. <laughs> no worries. I see. So when we put together the AI and ethical um, uh, guidelines, we've actually worked with experts from around the world, as well as some of the um, uh, the heads that we have in the city that within they're from the government or private sector that look after AI. And the, the reason why we wanted to make sure is we wanted to make sure that we're inclusive of everyone and making sure that when we put it together, it comes from across different partners and different aspects of um uh, basically, let's say, uh, businesses that are in Dubai as well. So, and at the same time, we actually worked with a lot of international experts to put the AI tool together. Uh, more details on, on the AI toolkit as well could be found on the website. Like any individual, whoever is working on an AI um, uh, project can go and test it themselves. 
and full on, full details are exclusive over there. However, it's really it's um it's a group effort that we looked into all of our partners within the city who are incredibly uh, specialized when it comes to AI, and we've worked with the global experts as well. Fantastic. And Alia, since okay. I have you unmuted, I'm going to ask the second question to you, and then I'll go to Saeed and Ayad, and then to Al. Uh, yeah. Alia, the next question is: is a uh, we look forward to seeing you. Uh, and at some Canadian conferences with the Cyber Exchange and CISO Forum that's coming up as well, which we will be hosting. So we look forward to seeing you there. But great. Second, we have some, some upcoming conferences that are happening in Dubai that the uh, Canadian audience should be interested in attending for now virtually and then hopefully uh, in person. See, the Dritex is happening soon. Um, uh, I believe it's end of October and that, that's a very great one to, uh, to basically be a part of. Uh, because it's going to happen and it's like a part of it's going to be digital and a lot of, um, and like so basically um, the audience from Canada will be able to join some of these uh, um, like you know online and digitally and also there will be a lot of the future blockchain summit as well um, all of these will be taking place uh, at the same time as the um, uh, Jitex as well taking place. If you, like, if you can bear with me, I can actually uh, get the actual dates. But that's going to be one of the major, basically, events that are happening. And um, we have, uh, basically, there's a whole, there's um, Jitex as well, um, which is uh, going to be heavily on, uh, we'll focus as well on future blockchain summit as well. All of them together are going to take place together as a big event and going to be towards um, October. So I feel everyone should be part of that event and it's a good event to take part. Um, and, you know, basically they research JITEX, FBS or um, JISEC is all together in one place. And apologies for the background, my son just walked into the room. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. No worries. Your video is switched off, so it's all good to go. Alia, yeah. thank you so much. And just for the audience, you know, if you follow us on Twitter, uh, Canadian Business Council, you can get some of the dates there as well, as well as Smart to Buy on social media. I'll take another three minutes for questions. And the next one is, uh, I think uh, Saeed and Ayad would probably want to tag team on this. And this is more around the talent pool. Are there any programs that allow for students that um, in post-secondary institutions in Canada to come and participate in the accelerators that have been set up in Dubai. Um, Ea, do you want to go first and then we'll go to Saeed? Yeah, thank you for this question. Uh, yeah, I guess like through our mission, especially like uh, the uh, innovation and the high tech one like JITEX or Dubai Air, so usually like uh, we share this information with the uh, University and Scientific Research Association. So they share it with the, the, their students and uh, uh, we are always welcome them like to have them with us in our uh, missions and connect them with some uh, accelerators in Dubai. And I guess uh, we had it before, like two, three years ago for uh, JITEX. Uh, we had some students from Ryerson University and uh, they met with uh, uh, some uh, accelerators or some uh, stakeholders for uh, research in uh, Dubai. And we are always open to have it again. Uh, usually I share all my project in Dubai or in UAE with uh, all universities, big universities in, uh, uh, in Ontario. And uh, we are uh, open to accommodate them for sure. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. And Saeed, if I could have you add some comments to that, but also there is another question that's targeted towards you. And that is how do you help companies understand whether or not they're going down the right path and if they'll be successful? I know we always say that, you know, you shouldn't be trying to fail, but you should also never fail to try. How do you help companies understand what the value is of whatever it is that they're working on, especially with the uncertainties around COVID? Saeed, if you can tackle both those questions real quick. Thank you. Uh, I mean, for the for the first question, we, we did work with a lot of different universities on our projects. Uh, we have an app that is called Area 2071. It's our sort of uh, virtual LinkedIn. I should have not, I shouldn't be saying this, but it's our virtual network platform that allows students, experts, uh, entrepreneurs to really connect together and really to find out what is out there that can be engaged with. Uh, the Dubai Future Accelerator as a program on cohort four uh, we had uh, university students who came from Malaysia specifically working on creating a robot that will clean the Dubai's Creek. 
so it was a floating robot that actually was, as it was moving around it was cleaning so it was quite it was quite interesting so we're definitely not shying away from working with university students if they were to have the right uh, product in hand and we'll definitely help them and support them to get engaged and to make sure that they are on the right path uh, in getting uh, some sort of a contract or an agreement with the government department to support in their growth as well. Uh, now, when we work with a lot of different startups, we try to make sure that we, uh, as, you, as you stated earlier, to have that soft landing. So we do, we do a lot of due diligence and hand-holding and making sure that they understand what they're coming to Dubai to do. Uh, specifically around the Dubai Future Accelerator, it's a nine-week program where they actually land in, in Dubai understand the challenges a lot better because now if they are physically uh, here, they can check the infrastructure, they can test uh, and pilot their technology uh, on that infrastructure. We, we do have uh, a number of programs that allows them to know how to deal with the culture, how to set up their companies and make sure that we tag along as they go and make sure that we are available to them at all times to make sure that they are going into the right path ensuring that at the end of our engagement with the companies, that there is a real impact and a real result because that's, that's our, our, our main aim. Uh, our, 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 uh, our, our aim is not to say we had six companies from Canada. Our aim to say that we had six projects and pilots live on the ground with Canada. So that's it's quite important for us. Fantastic. And on that statement, I will just ask Al one very quick question is Al, you mentioned something about the innovation licenses. Where can folks find out about uh, those innovation licenses? If someone sends us a, a, uh, an email, we can certainly um, respond to that specific email. I think there's a slide coming up with my address on it and we can address each one of those as, uh, as requested. Fantastic. I know that there was also a question on how our panelists feel about uh, the immigration context in light of COVID-19. And, and I think uh, I'll, I'll leave that question for perhaps another time because I think that's a separate webinar in and off of itself. To our panelists, thank you so much for tackling the q and I know there were much more, but time is of the essence now. We have two more little things coming up. And first is a little video on blockchain. And Hiba, if I can have you queue that up, the one thing I can tell you about blockchain is many theorists believe that blockchain is here to change the internet and the way we exchange information. Um, so I think you're going to be very interested in seeing where Dubai is going with blockchain. Hiba, if I have your attention, could you now show the video on blockchain and what's happening in Dubai? <laughs> Thank you very much Eva, for that video and with that ladies and gentlemen i'm about to take your leave as i have to actually speak now at another conference but we're going to have some closing remarks from our board of director dia hussein from the cvc so dia i'm going to turn it over to you for uh, some closing remarks and i thank you all for your time today okay thank you very much uh, ali on on this exciting discussions uh, on Dubai advantage and the technological drive to be world leaders in various sectors. We'd like to mention here that there is a clear and strong government support Dia, yeah, if you're still on, we seem to have lost your audio yeah. and Oh, well, I will chime in from Diana from CBC uh, uh, Dubai and thank you so much Tia uh, for mentioning we do uh, is absolutely so, correct. Uh, we have a really strong uh, 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 
technological advancement, as achievements award, all the Uh, we believe that the similarities between Canada and UAE is, far, is really far more than our differences, and particularly in the healthcare sector, education, artificial intelligence, and uh, uh, gas and oil and gas sector. As a bridging the gap between Canadian and UAE companies is our mission. We believe that more cooperation and investment is a good option to pursue for further development. To be more practical, we in CBC Abu Dhabi has departed from the old normal based entity and embrace the new normal by providing a solid business services to help encourage a safe and business-like environment for Canadian companies to invest in the UAE. And of course, vice versa. With that, I thank you very much. Thank you for your time for contributions and goodbye. Thank you all Thank and you. have a wonderful rest of the day, afternoon or evening, wherever you're joining from.